Lead in time is the amount of time that elapses between a business placing an order with a supplier for more stock or raw materials and the delivery of the goods to the business. Businesses want the lead in time to be as short as possible so that they can meet their customer orders and minimize the time between paying for the stock and receiving the revenue from the customer, however. This may not happen due to a number of factors such as delays in the supplier receiving the order or the breakdown of the supplier's lorries delivering the stock to the business. A new process for 3D printing things could pave the way for lighter, faster aircraft that potentially fly further on the same amount of fuel. Today's airplanes are held together with thousands of metal rivets and fasteners. That's because the lightweight but strong aluminum alloys used for their frames are considered unwieldable. Try to weld them and you get a phenomenon called hot cracking, in which the finished alloy weakens and fractures as it cools. This and other adverse welding effects also stand in the way of 3D printing high-strength aluminum alloy parts. When researchers have tried the resulting laser-fused mass flakes away at the welding area like a stale biscuit, another arm of the United States government was the FSA the Farm Security Administration, and they had a peculiar task, because in addition to the depression, which had obviously hit farmers quite hard because suddenly the material that they were producing wasn't really as value, yet their costs for producing it were exactly the same. They were hit not only that but also by another problem which was the Dust Bowl. And the Dust Bowl was this terrible broad that hit the American West and Southwest especially, and caused terrible economic problems for those farmers. To paintings, both called sunflowers, are generally accepted as the finest of several depictions of the thick-stemmed, nodding blooms that Van Gogh made in 1888 and 1889 during his time in Arles. The first is now in the collection of the National Gallery in London, and the second is in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Van Gogh referred to this work as a repetition of the London painting, but art historians and curators have long been curious to know how different this repetition is from the first should it be considered a copy, an independent artwork or something in between, an extensive research project conducted over the past three years by conservation experts at both the National Gallery and the Van Gogh Museum has concluded that the second painting was not intended as an exact copy of the original example, said Ella Hendricks, a professor of conservation and restoration at the University of Amsterdam, who was the lead researcher on the project. We are trying to understand the locomotion of one of our closest living relatives, which is the orangutan, and also the locomotion of all of the apes and the common ancestor of humans and the other apes. And in that area, we have had a big problem traditionally, and that we know a lot about how they move around the forest. I've been out to the forest and spent a year recording the different types of locomotion they use, but we have no idea about the energetic cost of how they move around the forest and the solutions that they find to problems of moving around the canopy. And what we're doing here is using the park or athletes as an analogy for a large-bodied ape moving around a complex environment and getting them to move around in the course that we've made that they've never seen before and we're going to record their energetic expenditure while they're doing it. Radon is a naturally occurring, colorless, odorless, and tasteless radioactive gas derived from the decay of thorium and uranium, which are common elements found in rock and soil. Radon gas becomes entrapped in houses and other buildings by seeping into cracks in foundations or basements or by entering through sump pumps or other drainage systems. 
Though most people have heard of radon, very few test their homes for the radioactive gas. One study reported that 82% of respondents had heard of radon but only 15% had tested for radon. The Czech Republic currently is undergoing transformation from the centralized regime of a communist dictatorship towards a modern democratic state. Fonta et al. recognizes three main events in the last half century that had profound consequences for the country and its land use. First, the communist coup d'etat and the following collectivization of land in the 1950s that introduced large scale collective farming. Second, the abolition of the totalitarian political system in 1989, which was followed by the restitution of private land ownership in the 1990. The thing that makes it difficult is because even if life had evolved on Mars, the chances of being preserved are very small. If we use Earth as a reference and our planet is teeming with life, yet it rarely preserves evidence of life of the fossil record. And the focus now is on exploring for habitable environments. If you're looking for water, a source of energy, either solar energy or thermal energy or chemical energy, and then organic carbon, assuming life as we know it on Earth based on carbon. So those are sort of the three things that we're looking for in the course of our mission. Also, malaria is something that is a very complex disease with this complex life cycle. That means that if you're going to eliminate it, you have to be able to target cute parasites and humans. You have to be able to target parasites in the mosquitoes, that mosquito population. And so that requires a lot of resources. It requires really good planning and a health system across all these different levels. And so I think the political capital that you need for that, the educational infrastructure you need for that, the economic resources you need for that are quite a challenge. Dave Hackenberg, a beekeeper since 1962, can usually tell what killed his bees just by looking at them. If they're lying on the ground in front of a hive, it's probably pesticides, he says. If the bees are deformed and wingless, it's probably vampire mites. But last fall, Hackenberg saw something he had never seen before. Thousands of his bee Colorado niece simply disappeared. He was in Florida at the time, pulling the lids off some of his commercial hives. To his horror, they were all empty. For many years, the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe, Susan Lozier, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disruptive. Although Oyakawa is much too young to have been directly affected by the expulsion of the Japanese Canadians from the Pacific coast, her anger at the treatment they endured during and immediately after the Second World War is apparent in the very use of the word violence in the title. Calling them euphemisms, she rejects such terms as interior housing centers, and sugar bee projects.
Green chemistry is a concept designed to develop technologies which allow chemistry to be practiced with minimal damage to the environment or in an environmentally compatible way. And it's meant to cover both chemical processes and chemical products. The center, if you would, set up about seven or minus one years ago. And the idea was to provide a hub of activities that covered fundamental research work, industrial collaboration, but also educational developments. So we work with schools and on public understanding projects as well, and also networking. So we network out to well over 1,000 people around the globe. I'm going to argue that the tremendous increases in productivity that we associate with the Industrial revolution originate not so much from changes in science or technology or new inventions. Where England was far from unique as from changes in attitudes, attitudes towards morality, towards what constituted the good, attitudes towards property, which became in England individuals long before it did on the continent, attitudes toward the proper role of government and together. These attitudes constitute much of what the Luddites were protesting against. For many years, the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Lozier, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted. There are some 250 million cars in America. 250 million cars in the country with just over 300 million people and most of those vehicles, of course, are gas-powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there is good news according to our guests today. And that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek. Fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels, and digital technology. And they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads? Our guests today will help answer that. Now that the story's been scratched, it is only part of contingency planning. But it was a symptom of the dramatic turn of events in South Australia, and it flushed out other remarks from water academics and people like Tim Flannery, indicating that things were really much worse than had been. Foreshadowed even earlier this year, so is Adelaide, let alone some whole regions of South Australia, in serious bother considering that the vast amount of its drinking water comes from the beleaguered Murray. Something many of us outside the state may not have quite realized is there. Predicament something we have to face up to as a nation. Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, Salford and its vicinity. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his city. Landscapes, peopled with human figures, often referred to as matchstick men, he painted mysterious unpopulated landscapes brooding portraits and the unpublished marionette works, which were only found after his death. Along the way we have built unashamedly beautiful buildings, two of which have one and another was runner-up in the prestigious United Nations World Habitat. 
Award. The first time an Australian building has received that international honor. We rely on older con. Steps of Australian architecture that are heavily influenced by the bush. All residents have private verandas which allow them to socialize outdoors and also create some defensible space between their bedrooms and public areas. We use a lot of natural and soft materials to build beautiful landscape gardens. Rebuilding carbon-rich agricultural soils is the only real productive permanent solution to taking excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. She's frustrated that scientists and politicians don't see the same opportunities she sees. This year Australia will emit just over 600 million tons of carbon. We can sequester 685 million tons of carbon by increasing soil carbon by half a percent on only 2% of the farms. If we increased it on all of the farms, we could sequester the whole world's emissions of carbon. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the Central Contract Patterns Generator, CPG. This produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in a way that produces running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between different modes such as going from a standstill to walking. These dogs aren't just man's best friend. Previous studies have shown that kids with dogs are less likely to develop asthma. Now a new study may show how if results from my supply to us. The work was presented at a meeting of the American Society for Microbiology. The study tests what's called the hygiene hypothesis. The idea is that extreme cleanliness may actually promote disease later on. Researchers collected dust from homes that had a dog. They fed that house dust to mice. They then infected the mice with a common childhood infection called respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV.